Late last year, Mark Hender and I were talking. I said, I think we really need to get access to a sounding board of consultants. So we went on uh, a search to try to find uh, the, uh, that firm. And Canna Cribs came up as one of the uh, prospects. So far, it's been going great. Uh, but our uh, head grower, uh, he understands the need. A lot of growers, are, they're kind of prima donnas. They don't want anybody else telling them what to do. But I think Bud uh, is looking forward to the advice and the synergies that can come from talking to somebody that sees a lot of grow operations uh, across the United States. So we've launched a few things recently. One of them is we have a whole beneficial insect like consulting team and website that automates beneficial insect, predatory insect delivery, growershouseauto.com. Kind of stands for Growers House Automatic Delivery. And um, that's really cool. So like you can get free consulting for like people who want to go away from like pesticides, insecticides, and move towards what nature is designed to like feast on these um, harmful predators to cannabis plants. So that's really cool. We just launched that recently. It's doing extremely well. And then uh, Canna Cribs Horticulture Consulting. Uh, we put together a team of like all-star cannabis cultivators, um, some with, you know, some PhDs and extensive experience. And they're building out, man, some of the largest and coolest facilities I know of right now. People are reaching out and they're like, we just got a license. We need to design a whole business plan, design a whole facility, design all of our SOPs, you know, design, you know, basically have architects and GCs come in and like our team does all of that. And we um, want to be as useful to cannabis cultivators as possible. And this is just part of that progression of us getting there. So TCAs or technical crop advisors are kind of the name that we've given to our in-house consulting crew. Um, it's part of a crew that we work very closely with the growers. We're not really standoffish like the other types of consulting would be. We try to really find out how your grow operates, um, kind of tap into the past experiences of facilities that we've either built ourselves, help grow or expand out, and then take the lessons from those as far as like efficiency, tools and methods, SOPs, and adapt them as well as possible for whoever's looking for whatever specific need, be it lighting, irrigation, IPM, all the big stuff. We're gonna be building out more and more services that help growers out through the whole spectrum of what they need help with, which is ginormous. And, um, that way they feel like they have like a good partner working with our team and what we're building. Um, it's really good to have other people to bounce ideas off of, uh, sharing successes with people, sharing failures. Um, and so having uh, Canna Cribs Horticultural Consulting to really talk to, um, they, they see other facilities, they see what other people are doing. You might get a good idea from something or say, oh, that might not work. So really it's, it's been an honor actually being able to have somebody uh, like Canna Cribs team, uh, even on the consulting side to really help us out and get some ideas pushed forward and really know that we're making some right decisions to, to make maybe make some different decisions that give us a different direction to go in. Because really it, we want to do it right the first time and having somebody else uh, to bend an ear to is, is really been helpful. When it comes to design packages, we can really kind of tailor what you need to what we can provide, whether it's a full building retrofit, a brand new build, um, whether it's an upgrade from an existing build. A lot of the times, if it's an initial build, we'll really start from scratch. We'll zoom it all the way back and start looking at the financial models, the business plan, the business model, were you expecting to be producing this much by year three, this much by year five? So we really try to project out as much success as possible based on what we know as the standard operating procedures and the typical costs for CapEx and OpEx. And we try to dial in that business plan so that we can confidently move forward with all the following steps. If it's something like a retrofit, we really like to audit the current practices there and we really like to make sure we can find as many efficiencies as possible before anybody moves on buying any equipment or changing any SOPs. A lot of the times in our experience, we can help a lot of cultivations out just by recommending certain procedures, changing certain SOPs and just adjusting the way they do things to be more efficient than buying a bunch of new equipment. So we try to bring a lot more of the knowledge and the practical experience of running these facilities rather than just trying to quote you out on things that you might need. 
we dive into what you're trying to accomplish as a grower. Because that's one thing that we all forget. It's like, if you want to do this your whole life or you want to do this for five years, there's goals for each. And we want to make sure we set those goals properly first so that we can achieve them later on. We've done multiple Zoom meetings with the Canna Cribs consulting team, and they uh, work one-on-one, -on -one, they email, they text, they, they really, really are there to, to kind of help you out. It's not, it's not about just trying to get, get the most, uh, most information out of someone, it's, it's what are your problems? What can I really help you with? And, and we're all, they're always there, it seems like, to really get to us, and at any point, we can call and have a meeting even the same day, uh, sometimes even right away. They'll say, oh, jump on it, let's get, let's get some video, let's get, get this fixed. So that's really honestly been very helpful. So Phil and Juan and all the guys over there have been really, really helpful to us. Like we're not just trying to build a whole bunch of, you know, uh, I would just say like money making machines or something like that. We're trying to build an ecosystem that helps growers. And um, by money making machines, I mean, this sounds weird, but like we have competitors that are just focusing on um, selling stuff. Uh, we're focused on making sure our customers are successful and then we know that eventually if we make them successful that they're going to appreciate that and it'll end up coming back to us keeping us alive yeah i'm glad that you i'm glad that we confirmed that we could save you guys a little bit of money on your calcium nitrate just Absolutely. by dialing it back yeah and then increasing your flower quality towards the end yeah yeah I and mean, we would have honestly like i said we would have been wasting more nutrients i guess down the line if you wouldn't have Given us those test examples and things like here that. Here to help. So, We're here like to help. <laughs> Grower's house has been a blessing for us. So, all right, uh, Marco, if you can get the slides up. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar on pesticide application. Um, I'm really glad to have one of the guys from DRAM that I've been working with for a long time, even before here, um, Scott Sterling. You guys all know me. I'm the host and technical crop advisor for these webinars. If you have any more questions about my qualifications, hit me in, hit me up with an email. But for now, I want Scott to introduce himself because I think he is a very important person for us to know in the cannabis space, especially with how important IPM control is for us. Scott, if you want to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So Scott Sterling, uh, I want to thank Cannon Crib and Grower House, Mike and Marco, and most importantly, the attendees, because if you guys weren't here, there would be no reason for us to be here. So we appreciate you guys' attention and your attendance. Um, I am a technical representative for DRAM. I've been with DRAM for four years now, and I work in the central part of the United States. Um, home for me is Wichita, Kansas. And um, as Marco noted, I've been in the horticulture industry for almost 30 years now um, with various experiences in commercial horticultural production, management and sales. Um, I've spent time dragging hoses, measuring pesticides, checking crops after hours, going in on weekends, all that fun stuff, right? Uh, so while I am not an expert in cannabis production, I am your OG when it comes to uh, commercial plant production. So uh, welcome to Horticulture Cannabis. We, we all are trying to do the same thing, grow healthy, productive plants. So if you don't mind, I'd like to also introduce, you know, just Dram and kind of who who DRAM is and what we do. Um, as Marco noted, you know, DRAM is an older company. We've been around since the 1940s. Uh, John DRAM was the one who started off DRAM. Um, he engineered and, and designed, you know, this, this, uh, the 400 water breaker, which has now kind of become, you know, the, uh, the, the logo and the, and the iconic uh, symbol for, for DRAM. It's kind of our cornerstone. Um, and from that, from that simple, you know, little water breaker, we've, we've grown into a very large company. Um, it is a it is a family owned company and it's been in business for over 80 years now. So four generations now involved. So we had John the originator and then we had Kurt Dram and now the, the current uh, generation is Heidi and Hans Dram and they recently we recently brought in the fourth generation which is Noah. Uh, so anyway, we've got you know four generations that have been involved you know with the, the, the Dram organization and we're happy to be you know where we are. Um, so DRAM, we focus on, you know, manufacturing and distribution of products that are, you know, help growing uh, for, for uh, the, the production of, of successful plants. And we've got four divisions. We have our consumer products, which are more of a retail type item. Um, we've also got our commercial products. That's where I work. We've got an organic fertilizer division. And then finally, we've got DRAM water. And I'll touch on those a little bit um, as we go through. 
Um, the consumer retail division, they service homeowners and they've got, you know, things like, you know, watering tools and sprinklers, you know, for, for the homeowner to help them, you know, with their, you know, successful gardening. Um, so with, with the commercial side, we continue to, you know, manufacture and, and build all of our products as much as possible um, in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Um, and with that, we have a number of different things that we manufacture. You know, we'll talk about some of this. You see this again, this is one, you know, kind of a, an iconic item for us, you know, our, our, our wand and shutoffs and, and, and uh, um, water breakers. We also have a, a complete line of irrigation systems. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got drippers. You know, this is, a, this is a, a drip ring that some of you may have seen or may be using, you know, with a, with a shutoff valve. And we've got, you know, nozzles, you know, for, for overhead irrigation. So uh, when it comes to irrigation, there's not much we can't do. Um, we just recently added on, um, we call it DRAM Outdoors. And so in, historically, when people have asked us, hey, can you help me with my outdoor production and with watering? Our answer was, uh, I'd like to, but I don't really have great stuff to help you with right now. Now we do. We've got some really large you know, piping and connections and and and, and uh, irrigation nozzles that we can do outdoor irrigation as well. So we're pretty happy, pretty happy to have added that on. Um, so all of our all of our systems um, do come complete with a you know the uh, total design specs and installation instructions. So it, it makes it a very successful package for you, the consumer. Uh, a couple other things that we do. We've got, you know, a complete line of environment, well, a, a nice line of environmental control systems by using your know, horizontal airflow fans. DRAM takes a look at uh, airflow a little bit different than some of our competitors. Uh, we'd be happy to talk, you know, that through with you if you're interested. Uh, thermostats for controlling temperature. We've got dehumid. We've got fog cooling uh, that we partner with a, a company out of, of um, Italy on. Um, we also have a a full line of organic fertilizers with our dramatic uh, fertilizer mixes that is all processed um, in our in our factory in northern Wisconsin. Um, it's available, you know, through many different outlets. And then finally, we've got Dram Water, which is probably our newest division. Um, and Dram Water is a complete design and and a supply system for for water irrigation from, from we call it from the source, you know, where your water comes in to the stem. And so through through that, we, we consider several things that you're going to need for successful water delivery systems. We take a look at the capacity of your irrigation. Uh, we take a look at water storage, filtration, disinfectant, uh, dissolved oxygen optimization, pumping and handling, fertigation. Uh, we also do complete site design and engineering. And then we do complete irrigation system design and integration. So... We combine all those expertise, you know, through our irrigation systems, our pest management and our, our expertise in engineering and, and system design and water treatment for to, to provide, you know, the best service we can through through uh, DRAM water. And so we go about this in a holistic type, you know, uh, we want to give you the best we can for your needs. So I say all that to say this, that we have the, the final the final, you know, division we have is you know our chemical application equipment and that's our topic for the day uh so you know dram we believe that there's no just one way to spray or treat plants um so as a result you know we manufacture and sell probably more well over 50 different machines to the industry uh either from spot spraying to space treatment foaming and drenching uh dram's got a machine for you so now let's get into uh the particulars of, of, of pesticide application and, and spray equipment Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's always awesome to hear about DRAM because they're not just a spray company. You know, they do so much more. So thanks for giving us an intro into everything you guys can provide. Of course, of course. And yeah, jumping right into it. So the first thing that I always think of when I'm thinking about applications is even before the application, the, the PP, the measuring, the mixing, all the safety aspects of using an actual pest control product. Um, one of the things about liquid products that I always try to harp on when people use them is, you know, you can't be mixing too much. You should always be mixing the smallest amounts. And one thing that people have a lot of problems on, I've seen, especially when they're using more professional products, is the label rate conversions. Because, you know, as you know, a lot of these products are in the ag or in the TNO space, and they'll give you rates for, you know, 10,000 square feet or by acre. And a lot of these guys don't know how to convert those into kind of their square footage of canopy. And so I always tell people things like, you know, an acre is about like 43 
thousand square feet. So if your canopy is about, uh, I don't know, say 11,000 square feet, that's about a quarter of an acre. And you can get that acre rate and just do that quarter conversion. And that generally gives you the right amount of pesticide to add. But of course, you know, these new manufacturers are putting label rates for smaller, smaller volume applications, which is pretty nice. I mean, have you, you, I know you, it's all about following the label, but did you have any guidance on kind of liquid pest control products and like kind of the best practices that you recommend when using or adding those into a tank? And you, yeah, you have hit on some really important things that, you know, the applicator needs to consider. And it is a bit of a challenge sometimes. You, you know, we often wonder, you know, the label is the law and, you know, they all tell you, you must read the entire label before using whatever product. Who's got time for that, right? Just cut the face and just tell me how to use this stuff. You know, but you are required to read the entire label. Uh, but we have provided in, for, for several of our, our uh, uh, pieces of equipment, you know, we've got, it, we've got charts and, and tables that will help you understand like you said, you know, if it's a if it's a per square foot rate, and you what you're looking for is a per ounce rate, we've got some conversion charts that are you know helpful and, and, and available. All you gotta do is just ask us. Uh, so we also have you know some other charts and stuff that we're able to provide you know to to the applicators. Um, but it is you're, you're right, it is a challenge you know, to break things down into smaller increments. And uh, you know some of the labels will have it on there if you take your time you know and read through. But yeah, that is an important thing to understand because things have gone wrong uh, by applicators not understanding these dilution ratios and not understanding how to break things down. And they have over applied, you know, because they put, you know, the, the labor rate for 100 gallons into 10 gallons or whatever. And they wonder right. why they drop. So it is very important and, and, and imperative to read those labels. Right. And, and the same thing with uh, reading the labels and knowing your product, you also have to know the equipment that you're measuring with. If you're using just like a solo cup, that's probably not that accurate. Same thing with dry with your dry pest control products. You should probably be calibrating your scales, in my opinion, at least weekly or every time you do an application just to make sure, especially with some of these products at how low the rates can be. It probably behoove a lot of people to make sure that their scales are good, that they're using graduated cylinders or the proper syringes. I mean, I know for DRAM equipment, um, it, it's kind of like set gallon amounts. So a lot of people I've thought I found they weigh once and then they just make a bunch of uh, ready to use kind of like bottles and then they'll just throw it into the tank mixes when they need. Is there any like guidance with dry mixes that you've uh, come across? I will throw this out there. So, you know, there are some really nice, you know, I mean, there are some granular applications in some areas. Right. And you can find these trays where you can Lay these trays out on the floor, and you can do a practice run of you know how much you know to you know, to apply. But so I'm, I'm going to piggyback off of what you just talked about, Mike, on on you know making sure you measure. We also talk about calibrating your spray your rig as well, and 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 understand you know what your sprayer is capable of doing, how much you're applying to a given area. Uh, but you know with our with our equipment, we do include you know cylinders or whatever some kind of graduated measuring thing. We do you know, absolutely important to to measure before you as you mix, but also know how to calibrate your equipment to spray the appropriate amount to the appropriate area. So those are all important aspects. Right. And then, of course, with dries, you always want to melt before you mix. You don't want to melt the product in the final application tank because you can never fully be sure of the, the homogeneity of that. And then well, um, we talk about is, you know, we, we want when, if you're, when you're filling your tank, we want you to put the, the, the amount of if you're using 20 gallons. We want 20 gallons into that tank. Then make a slurry, you know, in, in another five yeah. gallon bucket and then add that to, you know, the, your final mix. Don't dump that in first. We've seen this happen before. People dump in, you know, the slurry into the bottom of the tank and then add water. Well, some of that slurry went right down into, you know, the suction line. And so they wonder, how did I burn, you know, the first 10 feet? Because you had a very concentrated solution right in the bottom of that tank. It sucked it right up into the, into the, into the, you know, your, and also if, you're, if your machine has agitation, um, have your agitation running at the same time. Keep that stuff mixed as much as possible. Absolutely. And yeah, right down to where we're going to talk about agitation. And then, of course, there's pHing of your application tanks. You know, a lot of these uh, sprays call for like a 6.5, typically something a little bit more on the acidic side, but um, that's always a big thing. And then one thing about tank mixing that um, we'll get into safety, I believe, in like the third slide. But the last thing I want to touch on this slide is tank mixing and um, <clears throat> just kind of the uh, the order in which you should tank mix. And then why RO is not a great uh, not a great uh, medium to be doing these types of uh, tank batches in. 
Well, several there are several you know manufacturers that that if you again you read the label and it will tell you this is compatible with and this is not compatible with you know they'll, they'll give you some guidance but they also talk about doing the jar test and what the right. jar test is is putting those things you know into a jar and mixing them up and see you know does it you know make cottage cheese or you know or because I've seen it happen before uh, or or do they separate out you know so uh, you know the jar test it, it sounds silly. But man, is it going to save you a lot of money and headache in the, in the you know in the long run by just going through that simple step? Uh, so I, I know there is a, you know a, a list of orders. I don't have that you know in in my in my in my brain set, uh, but there are a list of you know preferred orders so that you can mix stuff. Uh, and right. I know that information is available. Uh, I don't have that one locked and loaded, but uh, but there is a list. You're correct. And it usually on the bottle or on the label, it will usually tell you like correct. You want to put your adjuvants in first, and you want to put like uh, say it's like something with sulfates at the end of this tank mix, you know. So the label, like you said, is the law, and you should always be reading that full label. And then well, one of the one of the other things, sorry, and one of the things oh, we touched on was it was the pH and RO, and so we yeah yeah, yeah please do, do not use RO, and there's more than one reason for that. Uh, because for, for for two things, you know, RO, you, you strip it all down, you know, and it's it's water is looking for, you know, to, you know, nature likes to find, you know, uh, equilibrium, you know, so you pulled all those minerals and stuff out, it's looking for them again, you know, so it's going to find them. Uh, it may find them, you know, in, in a metal lines, or it may find them somewhere along the way, and and but also you 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 re reduce the pH way down, uh, you know, so make sure you understand, you know, what you've got when you we we tell people, you know, blend back, you know, either some city water or well water or something, or use potassium bicarbonate something you know, to to bring that ro water back up to normal again otherwise you're gonna have issues yep absolutely yeah a little bit of bicarbonate is always nice to have in that water it helps buffer those swings in the ph2 which correct is really nice. yeah so on the application side so we have a couple of your most common uh application equipment here the hydra in my opinion being one of the most common and honestly the most useful in, in most times in cannabis but we also have the cold fogger which is awesome for certain products a foamer, which is great for like sanitation. And then of course, hand misters and backpack sprayers for either spot spraying or smaller canopies. What, um, like what would be the main advantage over using kind of more purpose built equipment like this versus something like a paint sprayer? <laughs> you know, my favorite saying is friends don't like paint, friends don't like friends use paint sprayers. <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a paint sprayer is, is designed to, to treat a flat surface, right? So that's the way that nozzle is designed to hit a flat mm -hmm. surface. Guess what you don't have? You don't have a flat surface. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've got a surface, you know, that you're, you're, you're hitting a canopy that's three-dimensional. Uh, and that's not what that paint sprayer nozzle is designed to do. You know, when, when somebody's interested in, in buying a, a DRAM sprayer, we go through a, a litany of, of, of questions and answers. And, you know, we ask, you know, what does your grow look like? Are, you know, are you multi-tier, single-tier? You know, are we talking about, you know, uh, flower? Are we talking about moms? What, are, what, are you, what do you have? Uh, because, you know, not everybody can afford several pieces of tool, you know, for several tools. I love tools. I love to have a lot of tools, uh, but tools cost money, right? Uh, so uh, if I were to own, and I've, I've used this example before, you know, the, the, the Hydra, in my mind, is a Swiss army knife of, you know, sprayers. It can do so many different things. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do like that one. But we do, we, we'll walk through, you know, do you want to be, you know, in that room when, when you know, the room's being treated? Uh, if so, we've got these machines. If not, then let's talk about an auto fog. You know, we put an auto fog in that room, set it and go home, and it sprays while you're not there. You know, so again, we have many tools that we can walk through and talk about. And it's important to us, and it's important to Growers House, that you guys get the right tool. We're not just trying to give you something just to get some money off of you. We want you to have a, the, the right tool that's going to do the right job. Exactly. Just why I like having your phone number, and I'm sure you uh, <laughs> get my call all the time. And oh, yeah. <laughs> and so mixing into these sprayers, um, some good practices that I feel are, are not, haven't been reiterated to a lot of applicators is things like, you know, always have your PPE on. You should always inspect and maintain the equipment before and after applications. And then this is a big one. Measure the pest control concentrate slowly and in the smallest increments possible. Can and, you know, you don't waste anything. Can you kind of go over why that's also good for, for your DRAM equipment and like some of the best practices in mixing a tank mix for one of these uh, sprayers or foamers? Right. Yeah. So when, so DRAM has done a number of, you know, on-site type training, you know, exercises. Well, we'll go to a site 
and we'll ask them, hey, show me your, your, your routine. Show me how you go about this. And, you know, we're just watching to see, you know, we, well, hey, that was great. I appreciate what you did there. But you know what you missed, you know, and so the big one and, and, and is, you know, we see applicators, they're mixing up their pesticide, right? And they have no PPE on whatsoever. And that's the most important time of all to have that yes. stuff. You've got to protect yourself with that concept. concentrates. Yeah, you're dealing with concentrates. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, you know, and especially the, the, no gloves. Are you kidding me? You know, you don't have gloves on when you're doing that. Uh, so, you know, yeah. Anyway, we start there, but then we do walk through and we make sure they understand, you know, that uh, there are proper tools for measuring, you know, you get a get a good beaker or graduate cylinder or, mm -hmm. or even I, at times, you know, it's, it, it is a it is a syringe. Uh, because some of stuff is very small, you know, increments. So make sure you understand, you know, how to measure that stuff, how to mix it, um, you know, and 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 we also talked about adjuvants. You know, do, do do you need an adjuvant? Something that you know helps you know, those chemistries you know, blend well together, or is it a spreader sticker that you need, or is it a, you know right. whatever? Make sure you've got all the things you need before you start, and make sure your sprayer works before you dump stuff in there. We, yeah, yeah. Do a test on while you're doing agitation. Do a test on the pump. Yeah. Correct. Make sure everything works. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so now that we're getting into the application part of it, um, say you have your tank mixed. Usually, what I recommend for cannabis, especially, is like a first pass over your rows uh, at a good distance, so you're getting full coverage. And then I always recommend a second pass through that row coming in from the bottom because you know a lot of our pests in cannabis are aphids, white flies, things that really like to get to the undersides of the plants. So as far as like some of the tools that Dram has available for like those under under plant under canopy sprays, like what are some of the things that Dram offers other than like a swivel head that would be good for something like that? Sure, yeah, and and, and we don't want to discount the idea of, you, know, you know that you've got a different you know target base than what we have been working with in the past. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we've been working in traditional horticulture with you know poinsettias and petunias and geraniums and that kind of stuff, right? You know, so you've got this big, tall, very, very yeah. dense canopy that's a little bit different, you know, than what we've been working with. Uh, you know, so I've said it before that you know, DRAM doesn't really develop things that are special for cannabis. We de develop things that are special for plant production, but we, I feel like we've got you guys covered. Uh, you know, so we we recognize it's important to have adequate droplet size. Uh, so understanding, you know, pressure, understanding volume of, of, of plant, you know, spray coming out your nozzle. Uh, so we can teach you how to go about, you know, figuring that stuff out. But we've also got some tools. And so, you know, I, I, love, I love showing off tools and sprayers at, at trade shows and stuff. Uh, you know, so this one, you know, we, we have a lot of fun with this one. It's, it's, a, it's a, an extension wand. You know, so this, at, it was at this size, it's like 20 inches long. It does extend out, you know, to, to like 40 inches. You know, so... Uh, you can see the, the, the rings on the end of there, that there's five nozzles on, on that end. You know, so if somebody's got big, tall moms, you know, they extend this thing out and you know, reach over to the top, you know, spray down from, from the top down on their moms, or they've got a dense canopy, they can reach into the canopy and spray up. You know, so you can imagine, you know, how well that, you, uh, again, like you talked about, Mike, top down, bottom up. You know, so we've got tools that if you're having difficulty, you know, getting proper coverage, talk to us about it. We've got tools, you know, that can help you uh, and so we've got other guys that say, listen, you know, what I don't want to have is a whole lot of freestanding water, you know, in, in my in my in my grow room. Then let's talk about a, a coal fogger, a coal fogger. You're not getting things wet. Uh, you know, you're walking through and you're 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 spraying, but it's a very, very small droplet. And if you're getting things wet, if you're seeing water droplets, you're going too slow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, again, it's walking through, you know, what is important to you in your pesticide management our practices and let's get the right tool into your hands. Yeah. And I think that segues perfectly <clears throat> into our next slide here. And I think Marco has a video of you operating that wand at MJ biz. I'm oh, sure. Really? Right. Yeah. After, after the uh, slides, I'm sure he'll go over that. But so that is one thing that's huge that I have recently been kind of really trying to reiterate, or at least teach a lot of the clients that I'm working with is the spray is just as important as your product selection. Like if you can't, validate and confirm that you're applying the products correctly, then you might as well just be, you know, spraying water at that point. So at not even worse, you can incur plant damage too, especially Correct. in our industry. So, you know, one thing that I've been recommending um, recently a lot is these spray indicator cards. I know you guys, Dram, of course, you guys have worked with these a lot. Can you kind of talk about the importance of like particle size, volume, and like how these cards play into, you know, validating a good spray program? Yeah, we love to use those those hydrosensitive paper. It, it it almost looks like you know the uh, 
the same you know, water, I mean, the insect traps that you might see Almost, the, yeah. the sticky cards, yeah. But we cut them in a small piece about the size of a poetry stamp. Mm -hmm. And we'll take those, oftentimes we'll do this with you without the applicator knowing where we're going to put them. And we'll put them you know, throughout the crop. And we we'll say, okay, go in there and spray. And we'll have them use water. But we ask them, do your normal spray routine. Show us how you spray. And then we'll go back and show them, you know, look, you missed this plant on the backside. Either because, you know, you weren't paying attention to the direction or you didn't have the proper equipment, whatever. But we use it as a, as a training you know, uh, a device. Uh, but it is important to understand how droplet size also plays into your know, proper coverage. Uh, thrips, for example, um, cannabis does get thrips. You know, it's, it's, it gets down, you know, and, and so they feed down into the really tight spots mm -hmm. of the flower head, where it's really difficult you know, to get a, a large droplet, you know, because that's what a high, you know a big hydraulic spray is going to put out big big droplets that don't fit into that that hole. So we need to talk about it. let's find something that makes a smaller droplet uh, because it's got to fit down into where that insect's hiding or aphids or you know spirites. Spirites is another one. You know when they get a very dense. <laughs> unfortunately, we've all seen it where they've webbed up, right? Uh, when they've webbed up, you, you've got a lot of problems. But you're yeah. probably going to go in there with a hydraulic sprayer and just really soak things down. You mm -hmm. know. Cause got to penetrate that web. So it is important to understand, you know, drop of size, uh, canopy penetration. I grew up in, in you know, in, in horticulture where we were trained spray to runoff. That way you yeah. know got everything covered. That adage is gone uh, yep. because you're spraying to runoff. Several things are happening. You're wasting pesticide for one thing because it's all dripping down. And it's not going to where you targeted it. You're wasting pesticide. You also might have a high concentration right around the leaf margin. Why am I leaving? Why am I burning leaf margins? Because yeah. you with a high concentration of a pesticide. So we do, we now talk about, you know, spray to heavy glisten just to the point where it's almost ready to drip. And you know how that happens? Practice. Practice makes progress. You know, you may not get it the first time, but learn, you know, you learn how you are, your, your habits. Um, we also talk about when we do sprayer training, we talk about, you know, propulsion. Propulsion is, you know, is the, is the pesticide or the spray stream headed towards, you know, your target. And then there's dispersion. And what we want to do is have that, that that spray head towards the plant, and then right before it gets there, then it begins to disperse. And that's where you're getting your best breakdown of, of the droplet size and best penetration into the canopy. So a lot of things to consider. Again, I tell guys, practice, just practice spraying a wall. You know, see how well you are just spraying a wall. Uh, it, it, you're never going to go wrong by practicing your spray routines. Yeah, yeah, and using these cards, like you can all, it, maybe you're going too slow, maybe you're going too fast. I've always seen the equipment issue, uh, you know, using something like a paint sprayer just doesn't have the volume or the actual like propulsion to to get up into those high canopies. Um, I mean, the wand you, that you showed had eight nozzles, and that makes sense because when we see the video later of how far that actually propels, you can get that entire four to six foot canopy sometimes, especially in these larger rooms or in a greenhouse setting, something like that. Right. Uh, one thing that I do want to talk also about is adjuvants or also like um, spreader stickers, tank mix compatibility improvers, things like that, acidifiers. I've always found, at least from a pesticide, a pest control product side, that you get much better efficacy and the rates that are labeled give you the control that you would expect if you use these adjuvants. A lot of the times you don't really get the efficacy especially for certain families of products like Marone stuff, if you're not using the proper adjuvants, do, is there anything with dram sprayers in particular, or is that just good spray practice? It's just good spray practice. You know, and we, we talk about those sort of, uh, you know, especially the, the spreader stickers um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the, uh, the adjuvant, you know, those, those type of things, because, or also even the surfactants, surfactants, you know, flatten out that, that, that water bead, right? Uh, because you want to get you know good coverage. When we start talking about you know fogging technology, um, we don't need those things in in fogging technology because the, the drop of size is already so small. We're we're talking you know down to you know you know uh, just you know, microscopic size, you know just very small drop of size that don't need to be flattened out anymore. They're going to get you're going to get good coverage. Uh, you know, uh, so. It, it depends on the type of equipment you're using. If it's a hydraulic sprayer, meaning you know you're getting things wet, right, with a, with a hydro or an MS20 or a backpack, those sort of things, those type of, 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 of piece of equipment do need, uh, you know, the, they can they will benefit, you know, from adjuvants. Uh, but when we're talking about foggers, all bets are off. We will prescribe something like if, if it's a, like a, a pulse fog, or it's a thermal fogger. Uh, we do talk about, you know, a, a product called Nutrifog. 
which does help mm-hmm. to propel and, and maintain a good spray. So we have, you know, some adjuvants in that regard, but, but, you know, the other type of foggers, we're not using them. Got it. That's pretty cool. And, and as, as far as like, um, you know, this actually rolls into, I just, I, I just saw a question go through. One thing that I see a lot missed in a lot of grows is the proper maintenance of the spray equipment. I can't tell you how many times I walk into a facility and I see their spray equipment with the tank mix from yesterday or two days ago. And I lose my, my, I lose it, you know, cause you don't know what's growing in there. All of the efficacy is probably gone out of that product. At that point, it's starting to actually like evaporate in the line and create gunk and stuff. So what is like, like a preferred soap or method to maintain and clean, like, say like a hydro or a, or a fog or something. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the adage old is, is triple rinse, right? So yeah. Rinse, yeah, rinse your machine, have your, have your agitation going while you do it. Uh, but you know, there's just some off the, I mean, Dawn dish soap, you know, warm yep. Dawn dish soap, you know, just, is, that's a great way to, you know, to, to clean out, you know, some of that crap that sticks along the sidewalls and stuff uh, and, and, and run it through your machine. Uh, you know, so, but, but proper, you know, clean your machine, uh, you know, that's, Ad, absolutely important and it's, it's it's more than just you know cleaning out you know the, the reservoir but it's also getting the, through all the lines and make sure you understand where is my filter because almost all machines are going to have a filter somehow somewhere and make sure you clean your filter and then also don't store like mike just what you pointed out you know having you know having pesticides stored in a machine terrible practice because you know there's a, a lot of things well some of the things that we're using are corrosive uh, mm-hmm. So, in particular, if you store any of your machines with corrosive materials in there, you're beginning to break that thing down. And so, one of the things that you know that that Dram is very adamant about is is you know we if, if we we go through the process of hey, are you going to be using, for example, zero tall, sanitate, strip it, any of those kind of you know corrosive type stuff? If the answer is on on, any, on, a, on a regular basis, if the answer is yes, then we need to make sure you get a stainless steel machine uh, mm-hmm. because without it. Again, back back to the spray, the paint sprayer. Why is my thing? Why is my paint sprayer breaking down and falling apart? Well, because you ate up from the inside, you know, with with those corrosive materials. And where did that metal go? I mean, it went somewhere. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Might have gone to drop. You know, I don't know. Uh, but right. yeah, we are very adamant about making sure that if you're going to be using corrosive materials, get stainless steel components on your machine. Awesome. Yep. And I, yeah, I always tell Don and dish soap too, because it's like the cheapest, most effective. It breaks those emulsified concentrates and all the oil based products down really well. Right. So, yeah. Um, one last thing I want to touch on, uh, I guess, before we move on to the QA section, is one thing that is also very often overlooked is the compliance side of all, all of these pesticide applications. You know, one thing that I don't see at a lot of facilities is copies of all the SDSs. I unfortunately don't see a, a lot of application logs or I don't see application logs filled out correctly or with the proper amount of information. Um, you know, they should always have the product and the rate that you're using, the dates and who did the application, where and when. Is there anything as far as like um, like with the DRAM equipment, is there any record keeping or kind of like preventative maintenance checks that should be regularly done for that equipment? So it is an important aspect because one of the, so when I was a, you know, a spray technician, the one thing, and then as a manager, the one thing I did not want to do was lose the confidence of my employees that I am, you know, absolutely taking care of you know, and yeah. concerned for their health. I don't want them to ever feel, you know, nervous about what I applied just, you know, yesterday or a half hour ago is going to somehow contaminate them. You know, so adhering to the worker protection standards and adhering to the label is very, very important for a lot of reasons because you don't need, you know, OSHA come knocking at your door saying, hey, you know, let's see your log. Let's see what you've been doing. I'm going to talk yep. to your employees. You know, you do not want that visit. Um, and, and they can do it if they want to. Uh, and all they need is just one employee that's upset <laughs> that, you know, you did something wrong and they're going to come knocking. You do, don't want that visit. Uh, so, no, we, we, we advocate, you know, that uh, you, you absolutely you clean your machine out. And that you understand, you know, the work protection standards and the the REI, the reentry interval, all those sort of things, and that's all going to be found on your label. And you yep. know, so uh, you know, with the one of the things that we 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 talk about and with our DRAM equipment is, you know, that uh, that we make guns. You know, the, the chemical manufacturers they make the bullets. You know, so make sure you understand, you know, that these things work together. Uh, you know, so uh, we don't write the laws on, you know, the, the, the chemistry men that are being used, but we do work very closely with these guys because we want to make sure that their chemistry is going to work well with our machines. You know, so we do a lot of, you know, uh, legwork and, 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 and go to meetings and talk to these guys to make sure that, you know, the things that they're 
going to manufacture, going to work well with our machines and everybody else's machines as well. You know, we're not just concerned for right. grant, we're concerned for, you know, for the industry, uh, but we're very active in those roles. But yeah, back to you know, the compliance thing, you, you, you need to stay, you know, compliant because you don't want that call. Uh, you just yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, like you said, the employee can come back at you as a big thing because if you're not issuing out this type of PPE, if you don't have records that this employee has access, is trained and has a maintenance schedule for this PPE, you know, that's liability on the on the grow on the company, too. Correct. So just to be safe, it's always good to take the safest practice, get with your local ag extension or one of the TCAs from our side. Even guys from your side um, on on the DRAM side, you guys could probably right. guide people to the right state agencies to get that. Correct. But having this down is just as important as spraying. And then the spraying itself is just as important as the pest control products. I guess that's two of the things that I really wanted to uh, harp on this particular webinar. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I think we got through most of the or all of the slides here. Um, Marco, if you want to pop back in. Um, Thanks for paying attention, everybody. I hope a lot of this information was useful. Yes, hey guys, I'm back. That was great. Um, I wanted to actually share before we get into the Q and A really quick uh, the video that you mentioned earlier in the in the, uh, oh, yeah. the top of the webinar, and maybe um, uh, Scott, you can kind of walk us through what we're seeing here. This was, I guess, you guys shot this at MJ Biz last month. Um, this is one of your hydro machines, I think, right? Yeah, and that's an electric one too. A lot of guys think they're only gas, but the 120 volt electric, roll it through your indoor facility all day. Right. It's pretty quiet. And then it has a sweet root. Uh, a lot of guys try to run drenches through their fertigation system. They clog all their filters. Use your IPM equipment for IPM drenches. Like, come on. Yeah. And then that just shows the inner agitation. And I'm not seeing the video on my side for some reason, so I can really oh. can't comment on what I'm looking at. So sorry about that. That's okay. Mike, Mike I guess, could maybe explain it. We're, we're looking at the reservoir tank right now um, on yeah. the Hydra. And it, it probably does show how important it is to us, you know, that we do agitate with, with the Hydra. It agitates all the time. There are some sprayers on the market that will agitate, you know, when you're not spraying, but you pull the trigger and they're no longer agitating. Ours settles. are always agitating, which is really important. Yeah, because it's sharing a pump, but on those hydras, right. that yeah, the agitation pump's always going. Wettable powders, you have to, you know. There's that right. wand. Yeah, check that. Check out the distance on that. Sweet. That wand. Yeah. So that was actually one of the uh, questions that came in uh, while you guys were chatting from oh. Miguel Aldez. He's actually just wanting to get some more information on that wand. Um, and I guess that's something. Can you can you find that on your website then, Scott? Or there is there is a there is a picture, and there's also uh, yeah, and th there is a picture and a description on the website. And I do know that our website is not necessarily always easy to navigate. There's a lot of information there, uh, but it's not always easy to find. Uh, but uh, it, it it is on there, and it's called Extension Lance. Um, Extension Lance, that's what it's called. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. That'll help us uh, with the search. Maybe Mike, you can answer one of these uh, until sure. Mike until he gets back. Um, general best practices, uh, you know, for when you're when you're uh, laying out your your pest control on your crops. I know you guys mentioned yesterday in one of our quick chats um, leading up to the webinar, um, you, you go through the entire crop, misting the top, and then you go through the entire crop upside down, misting the bottoms. Right? Is that yeah. something you you teach people or? Yeah, that's generally the application practice that I'll recommend. Um, as far as like uniformity and how well that is being done, because you could do that all day, but be doing it improperly. You have to get those spray indicator cards in. It looks like Scott's back in, but you have to get those spray indicator cards in your canopy. I like to tell people to put them at the top of the canopy and then two thirds and then about one third from the canopy from uh, the bottom of the pot, just so you can see what the coverage is. If you are getting full coverage, what the droplet size is looking like. Maybe you got to get a different tip or a different type of wand, something like that. So having those spray indicator cards in there to validate how you're spraying is the only real way you're going to lock down a proper, efficient, and effective spray program. Unless you've been doing it for 30 years and you know exactly the time. And I have been using this Hydro for 12 years. I know guys like that. But if, you're, if you haven't been using spray equipment like that, that effectively, you're not like an actual qualified applicator. You definitely want spray indicator cards to give you some metric. So the the sustainability goals is that the question we were working on? Yeah, exactly. 
So the best thing that you can think about when you're thinking about sustainability and using these pest control products, I, I guess first would be product selection. Obviously you wanna stay in the safer range, usually all OMRI products or 25B products. Um, the second is getting that uniformity, getting that metric of how you're spraying really allows you to not over apply. It allows you to pick the right products for how you're applying. And once you have a good spray program down, then you can start transitioning later um, IPM programs to things like beneficial insects, which have a very low environmental impact. So that's how I would probably recommend if you wanted to focus on sustainability, focus on choosing the right products, making sure you don't overuse those products, and then seeing how you can transition away to non-chemical products. Great. Thank you for answering that. And welcome back, Scott. Like, yeah, I don't know what happened there, but thank you for bringing me back on. Oh, of course. Awesome. No, of course. Um, we were just getting into a couple of questions. It looks like Russ uh, Schmies, excuse my pronunciation, Schmies maybe. Um, is there a timeline update on the electrostatic wand slash gun for the Hydra 200? Man, yeah. <laughs> so we've we, we've had this thing, you know, in, in uh, our, our plans for release for almost two years now. Uh, so what we don't want to do is bring this thing onto the market and have it fail, right? Nobody wants that. We probably should have kept it under wraps. Uh, we we kind of thought it was going to, you know, roll out faster than it did. Uh, but anyway, so we've got we've got a model right now that we are testing again. Uh, we we made some out because it's it's got to be robust because uh, mm -hmm. you know people will bang things around. And right now we're concerned, you know, that uh, you spend a thousand dollars, let's say, you know, for this thing. And it breaks, you know, on use three, you're not going to be happy. So the answer is no, we don't have a release date yet, but we're getting closer. Um, I don't want to tell you, Scott, I told you people were going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, do, do, I, we did have it at, at uh, the MJ Biz this year, you know, the newer model. And we showed it around a little bit. Uh, but no, it's it's yeah, we're getting closer. Good. Nice. We're all waiting, Russ. Trust me, we're all waiting. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like uh, it looks like we have Jared and Noah from your team kind of helping answer some questions in the chat. So awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, there's Thanks, some, guys. some information on the L5 extension lance there and then the Hydra L5 QC. Yeah, I you know, I used to be I, the marketing director at Green Bros. And, you know, it's always, you know, you're trying to rush something to market because you want to beat the competitors. And then there's there's R&D delays and there's there's a lot of different things that, you know, unfortunately slow these products down when they finally get to market. So um, looks like there's one question in the chat from Isaac Paps. It's just touching on electrostatic. I, I, I don't know exactly what that means. I, I'm new to what electrostatic means, but maybe just for a couple of minutes, you can explain what that is for those that are watching that don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll take a run at that one. So sure. um, it's not new technology. Um, again, I came from the, uh, you know, horticultural world of growing petunias and poinsettias, right? And I was an early adopter of this technology. Um, I, I heard about it, learned about it. I want one of those machines. Uh, so I'll try not to use brand names, uh, but I had one. And, you know, I saw the advertisement, you know, spray at the apple and watch it go around the apple and stick to the backside. And this is cool. I want one. Uh, so I began to use it. Um, and was not necessarily, you know, satisfied with the results that I got. I've since learned how important it is that the target be grounded, right? So because you're, now we're talking about physics and it's an electrical, it's electrical conductivity that we're, try, we're trying to, you know, complete a circuit, if you will. Because with the hydro, hydrostatic sprayer, you're, uh, you're putting a negative ion or a negative charge on that droplet, okay? And so what that droplet's looking for is a place to, to land, you know, like magnets. You know, negative, you know, they don't, like, they don't like to stick to negative, right? Negative, we're looking for positive. You know, so it's got to be grounded in order to complete that circuit, if you will. Uh, so plants on plastic, you know, plastic pots up on, a, on aluminum bench, or plastic pots on a plastic bench, or those things are not grounded. So there's nothing there to complete that, you know, that, that uh, connection. If you've got a crop that's grown in the ground, you know, in the soil, or if you've got a crop that's on the ground, then you are grounded. And then we're going to talk about, you know, this is going to work. That's not the only thing that's going to be helpful in this technology, though. The other thing that we talk about with this, uh, the electric sprayer is that you are, you're, you're, you're uh, putting a negative charge on that droplet, and now you, you create a droplet. Let's say it's you know, a 60 micron size droplet, right? What we want to do is keep that thing at that size. 
what can happen is a 60 micron droplet find another 60 micron droplet and they stick together and now you've got 120 size of micron droplet. So you, you ruined what you just created. You had these really nice small droplets. They, com they collide with each other. They stick together and now you've got big droplets out there hitting your, your target uh, plant. With the negative charge, they repel each other. So you keep that size that, that you that you created. So we think there's a lot to be said, you know, for that technology in that regard. You're, it's all about creating the, the right size droplet and keeping the right size droplet. Wow, that is that is a lot of information I had no idea about. That's really interesting science. Um, Super cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, OK, I think probably the last question um, that we'll have time for um, is I guess it's more of like um, uh, you know how to how to mitigate or how to manage um, uh, let's see in the event of a spill or unexpected situation yeah, um, during a, a con pest control operation what emergency response procedures should be in place to address and mitigate potential risks uh, promptly. This takes me back to the uh, safety, health, and environment days, but uh, you should know a company and a phone number. Um, Google Chemtrek, C-H-E-M-T-R-E-C. It's a pretty prominent company in the U.S. that does these types of hazmat um, uh, reporting and things like that. Um, always check the label. The label and the, uh, with the worker protection standards and the storage requirements and all that stuff, it will have emergency guidance there as well. So that's I, I would also I would also add to that you know, don't overreact don't don't do something don't don't you know, knee jerk reaction get the hose out and start hoses up down the, you know the, the the drain you now you've got yourself in a mess you know just yeah. re relax breathe go check the label if you don't know what you're supposed to do before you do something really stupid um, yeah okay great and then I guess this would be an opportunity um, Scott if if you you guys you know had any kind of new products coming out or maybe any any other maybe in closing, uh, anything else you wanted to add uh, to the webinar before we close out? So one of the things that we've been hearing is, so again, we, we did talk about, you know, that the, the DRAM is not in the business of, you know, creating specialty type stuff for, you know, just for cannabis. We create stuff, you know, for, for horticulture in general. Um, but one of the things we've been hearing in particular, you know, from the, from the cannabis crowd is, hey, you know, that, that MS-20 sprayer, which we didn't talk much about, but it's a, it's a 20 gallon sprayer. It's got a smaller footprint. Right. So a lot of guys, they love that sprayer because of smaller footprint, easy to move around. What they don't like about it is that it seems to be, you know, somewhat underpowered or, or it doesn't. It, what it does not have for sure is recirculation back into the tank. We're hearing that message and we are working on developing another iteration, another model that mm -hmm. will have recirculation back into the tank. We've also heard people talk about, hey, I want to be able to, you know, if I need to reach into that tank and be able to clean it out. You know, it's got right now it's got a hole about that big around you know uh you know so you're not going to get in and do much we, we we we've heard your request and we're changing that as well it's going to have the larger size opening on the top of it almost like the hydra does uh cool. so you can get inside and clean that thing out so we do hear we do respond uh you know so but you know we don't we we the the, the, the for example the, the, that ms20 that technology is almost you know, 30 years old now you know so we, we build things that are going to last and stick around. So we don't have to have a lot of just new stuff all the time, but we do hear you guys and we do respond. Awesome. Looking forward nice. to that. Yeah. Thank you. And then, you know what, there's a quick um, one last question that just popped in. Is it possible to just buy, buy five head components and not the wand? My sprayers regularly break the wands, but the heads have lasted. So I, after the rigid wand, do they accept the heads? Um, yeah, it looks like you have an answer to that, Scott. <laughs> so, so I do that. My, my disclaimer for this guy right here is it is somewhat fragile, I guess is the best word to use. Uh, it, it this is all stainless, okay? So, there's a misunderstanding about stainless. Stainless, while well, it, it does, it's it, it can break, it's, it's a, it, it does not bend, it breaks, yeah. you know. So, you you, you put some brush on it, you're gonna you're gonna break it or crack it or whatever but yeah the answer is you can if you if you're damaging these things you're not gonna weld this these these nozzles the tips back on uh because they it's a it's a it's a stainless steel weld uh i'm showing you this this does come off and you can buy just that ring okay and that will work as long as you have sufficient pressure going through right correct yes and cool. yes if, if, if this will fit onto your you know whatever thing you want to adapt it to you 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 can use it, man. You can buy just the ring by itself. I think that was the question. There, there's the answer. 
Awesome. Yeah, I think so. Perfect. Yeah, you go to Home Depot, you can make any threads fit anything, you know. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, you know, this this is stainless, you know, so yep. make sure that you don't do something silly about, you know, if you're using your Sanitate Zerotol, whatever, uh, that you don't use something that's not, you know, don't, don't contaminate your crop. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and share our 10% uh, off coupon right now um, for the audience. Uh, for, so for now, through January 31st, uh, Nate and the team of our Growers House are extending that 10% off Duran products. Uh, go to growershouse.com um, and it's the code is DRAM10, so D-R-A-M-M-10. Uh, again, if you're looking to buy some DRAM products, jump over to growershouse.com right now. You can click on the link if you're on your computer there. The Learn More button will take you directly to the DRAM page. Um, a couple of quick shout outs to some of the folks that are probably watching right now. We've got a, a way to subscribe to these webinars. Mike and I are trying to do these monthly. We try to do them towards the end of the month. Um, kind of allows us enough time to find amazing guests like like Scott here and, and assemble a, a nice little info uh, deck so that you guys can learn about certain products, specific things, and of course, you know, ask these experts directly. Um, we've got a couple of subscribers, Greg uh, Butters, uh, Black Rose Cultivators, and um, Lelia Scarbo. Wow, that's a good name. Don't know how to pronounce it. But um, anyway, so yeah, if you guys wanna subscribe to these webinars, you can um we're gonna have uh as soon as i kind of get this video cleaned up and edited a little bit um we'll send a follow-up email to everybody who signed up for this webinar and you'll be able to watch it again if you you know want to go back and if you think you missed anything throughout the webinar you can rewind it at your leisure um we're also going to be housing them on our canic cribs r d um channel on youtube so we've got some other uh, really great webinars up there that we've done this is our fourth one for the year um everything from um what did we cover mike uh, we, uh nutrients Bugs, nutrients drying and processing environments and now we have done application methods and efficiencies perfect so yeah by the end of this series maybe in a year or so you know if you're new to cultivation or if you've been doing it for a long time and you're already running a big operation just sitting for a few hours and watching content will always refresh your knowledge and, and maybe there's some new information out there that these guys are bringing that uh, you know can be very useful to you in your in your cultivation. I know Mike and the Mechanic Cribs Consulting team are amazing. They're a very talented uh, group of guys. You saw the video at the opening. Um, you know, it's something uh, initiative that that Nate um, has been spearheading for the last couple of years, and we're now kind of turning that corner right now for kind of developing our um, kind of ag solutions type business model. But um, but yeah, Mike, you want to um, maybe kind of wrap it up here and, and let anybody know how to best way to get a hold of you and then Scott as well, the best way to get a hold of you. Um, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, I mean, you can get a hold of me at Mike at canacribs.org, of course. And um, any of the commercial uh, sales reps over at Growers House can help you out. <clears throat> I was going to say, if you find something that DRAM makes and it's not on our website, it doesn't mean we don't carry it. It just means we don't have it on the website yet. Let us know. Me and Scott, we call. So anytime you need anything, we can get anything from DRAM. And if you're looking to make a large scale irrigation setup, let us know too. We'll link you guys up. Scott, Very good. Thank you. Info? Yeah, I, I appreciate you guys giving this opportunity. You know, it's important that we, uh, you know, inform, you know, the growers what's out there and what's available uh, and, and provide you know, professional equipment to professional growers, right? That's what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. I guess that's it then. Thank you, Scott, again, for taking the time uh, this week to work with us on this webinar. Um, of course. And, and again, Mike, thank you again, my partner in these, uh, these really fun educational opportunities for folks. And myself, I learn a lot from these. So um, happy holidays to both of you. And happy holidays to everybody who's watching. I hope you have a safe one with your loved ones. And um, we'll see you sometime next year. Thank you. Well, cheers, everyone. Have a happy holidays. All right. Take care, guys.